Peloton has a master plan to become the biggest fitness company of all time, and I believe I know what it is. But first, it's important to understand what has happened to Peloton over the past few years and why the market value of their company has plummeted from over $47 billion to less than three in just two years. So Peloton had been steadily growing in the late 2010s and was just starting to become mainstream by the end of 2019, when as many people may remember, they were all over the news for their infamous holiday commercial. A year ago, I didn't realize how much this would change me. I know for me at least, that was the first time that I ever heard about Peloton. Now fast forward nearly four months, and then all of a sudden with the pandemic, most of us were stuck at home, and with most gyms being shut down, lots of us were looking for a home workout solution. And what was the one home fitness device still on everybody's mind? Peloton. And as you probably know, Peloton's growth skyrocketed, and they couldn't manufacture enough bikes to meet the huge demand. Now the founder and then CEO of Peloton, John Foley, had a few interesting beliefs. First, he thought that connected fitness was a winner takes all category. So being able to get these bikes to everyone who wanted one was of vital importance. Even going as far as spending a hundred million dollars to fly bikes overseas instead of by boat just to have them delivered more quickly. His second belief was that he believed this accelerated growth was not just a byproduct of the pandemic, but it represented a new normal in consumer behavior and interest, and so this unprecedented demand and growth would just continue. And so Peloton continued to invest hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of more millions of dollars to acquire numerous companies and manufacturers, even began constructing a new state-of-the-art $400 million manufacturing plant in Ohio called Output Park. Then, as you can probably guess as things started to open back up and people were leaving their houses again, sales started to decline. And this decrease in sales happened just as Peloton was ramping up their production, which led to them having a huge inventory of bikes just sitting there and still having to pay the bills for all of the workers and storage and manufacturing plants and acquisitions and loans that were still there things were starting to look pretty bad for Peloton and the problems just got worse and worse and the Peloton stock, which was once valued at over $170 per share, tumbled down and down and down to now under $9. So John Foley stepped down and was replaced by a new CEO, Barry McCarthy, who was the chief financial officer for Spotify for over four years. And these two CEOs couldn't be more different. John Foley being more of a visionary with probably, hey, a bit too much optimism. And then there's Barry, who's very much a numbers guy who was set to restructure Peloton into a business that was actually profitable instead of just hemorrhaging money. And so they've been ruthlessly cutting jobs, eliminating all of their own manufacturing and deliverers. And with Barry, he's really interesting because you have to sort of ignore what he says because he often does the exact opposite of what he says publicly. For example, one of his promises was that the Peloton membership price would not be increased. And then they announced a price increase less than one month later. Or he'll talk about the importance of getting the equipment to be a lower price and be more affordable, and then immediately raise the prices on almost all of their products and reveal one of the most expensive rowers ever made. But even if you can't trust what Barry says, you can sort of predict what he and Peloton will do next, just as long as you focus on their actions. Because based on their actions, I believe Peloton master plan is much more focused, nuanced, and actually positive for Peloton than you might think by just reading the headlines. There seems to be three interconnected strategies at play here, but first, make sure to subscribe to Connect the Watts if you haven't already, if you want to continue to get the latest information on connected fitness like Peloton. Okay, so the first of three strategies for Peloton's master plan is a shift in pricing structure. See, one thing that Barry McCarthy did say that I believe got misinterpreted 
interpreted was that he wanted to have a good, better, best pricing strategy, sort of how Apple does with their products in order to reach a broader market. Afterwards, he immediately raised the prices of the Peloton Bike Plus and the Peloton Tread. And with their more basic treadmill costing $3,500, many of us were wondering what happened to that good, better, best strategy. But I believe Barry's choice of words were really the issue here, because what he meant seems, at least to me, was that he wanted the original bike to be as cheap as possible to drive membership growth and then everything else to be brought up in price and thus the price increases and very expensive rower. And this actually makes complete sense because Peloton's main and really only source of profit up until now has been their membership subscription. And Peloton has struggled to see a huge growth in memberships from just selling their treadmill. And since most of the treads were bought by people who already had a Peloton bike and were already paying a membership, the treadmill sales didn't seem to be pulling in much profit. So knowing that most people aren't going to buy the Peloton tread as their first Peloton device, raising the cost on it to make profit on the front end rather than relying on the membership makes a lot of sense from their perspective. Same with the rower because they know that very few people are going to buy the Peloton row who aren't already members, so why not sell them to try to get as much profit on the front end instead? Because they know if a Peloton owner wants to pay for a Hydro, which is cheaper, they'll still have to pay the difference in price through having an additional membership. So selling a Peloton row at a higher price than Hydro's makes a lot of sense. And I think we're gonna to continue to see the original Peloton bike itself get cheaper and cheaper and sold to more locations, which is now being sold at Amazon and Dick's, but I imagine that there are other store deals happening soon as a way to get that entry product out because Peloton knows that if they can get you on a bike with a membership, that membership retention is insanely high and that's where all of the profit is. And if you want any other products, it makes sense to buy theirs since it's in the same ecosystem. And so even though it's at a higher price, you'll end up paying it because otherwise you'd still have to pay that extra cost, but through additional memberships. This is why I think if Peloton ever releases a tonal competitor, I think it's safe to assume that it's gonna cost around six to $800 more than tonal. And this isn't the only shift in pricing structure that I think we'll see, the other being their digital app, but we're gonna discuss that in a little bit. First, let's talk about the second strategy that Peloton seems to be implementing, and that is a shift in content. Now this subtle but very powerful shift to Peloton's content is exclusivity. First, they tried it out when they released a Peloton guide, which they made all of their new strength programs exclusive to the guide for the initial seven weeks. And that product was released in such a bad state that this exclusivity was literally the only reason most people bought it. So even though the sales weren't great for the guide, the exclusivity strategy itself, I believe was seen as a success as they are doubling down on it with the release of the Peloton row. Except this time, the content looks like it's going to be permanently exclusive, meaning the only way to access any rowing content is by having the Peloton row itself and thus eliminating all the potential sales of Peloton owners who might buy cheaper alternatives and use them to take Peloton rowing classes. And I think this is coming next to the Peloton tread and then possibly though less likely again for the Peloton bike. The other thing you may have picked up on if you've been paying attention is the shifting of popular coaches away from older products to newer products. Growing the power zone coaching staff on the Peloton bike earlier this year wasn't ever about providing more power zone training. I think it was a way for them to take one of the most popular coaches for members most likely to buy additional cardio equipment and make sure he was coaching more on the tread and eventually the rower. And recently the announcement that Alex Toussaint, one of the most popular coaches on the bike, will instead be coaching on the tread. And I have seen a ton of comments from people saying things like, damn, looks like I'll finally have to cave and buy the treadmill, which is exactly what Peloton wants. And the third strategy that Peloton is making is a shift to their digital app. So Barry might say things like he wants Peloton to be the Netflix of fitness apps. But again, I think he means something slightly different. Instead, I think he actually wants Peloton to be a direct competitor to Strava, as it looks like they are slowly putting together the framework to be able to compete directly against Strava, a company which has exactly what Peloton has always wanted, over a hundred million members. I mean, just look at the changes Peloton has implemented recently. The app now lets you track 
impact workouts when you're not on the Peloton, including outdoor runs and rides. They are creating a news feed for you to be able to share your workouts and comment on your friends. They just created a new app for Wear OS that allows you to integrate with workouts within their app as well. And they released the ability to make your own workouts on the Peloton tread for those who might have a coach or be following a different program. And eventually if they can add outdoor running and biking routes and heat maps and everything else that Strava does, they might actually be able to pull it off as not only could their membership do everything that Strava does, but also layer on top of it, access to arguably the best fitness content available. And so I actually think the Peloton digital app is going to be shifting dramatically over the next year. I believe the plan is just to follow in Strava's footprints here and make the basic app free for workout tracking, sharing with friends and so on, and then have a premium membership, which adds on classes and more in-depth features. And then of course the ultimate upsell, the equipment which each has its own exclusive content and which integrates seamlessly into the app tracking service. And if you look at the numbers, while Peloton has lost an enormous amount of money over the past year, a lot of this was due to having to pay off early cancellations of contracts and layoffs and so on. But if Barry actually executes on this plan, I think Peloton is going to be in a really strong position for 2023 and continual growth onward and in a much stronger position in the long run than I believe most people expect. And I'm not saying whether these shifts in strategy are good for the Peloton customer or not. That's for you to decide. And let me know in the comments what you think. Do you believe this is Peloton's master plan or am I missing something? Again, this is Colin Jenkins with Connect the Watts. Appreciate you being here as always, and I'll see you next time.